recording here. They announce it, so I don't have to, I suppose. Um, so hello, everybody. Um, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, my name is Sarah McKenzie, and I'm an organizational psychology consultant at Jalapeno Employee Engagement and your MC for this evening. Um, due to the overwhelming event interest in our event tonight, we have been asked to record it so that we can share it with people following. So like the lovely voice said, this is being recorded and it will be shared with you following the event. So for everybody that we're meeting for the first time tonight, we want to welcome you. We're so glad to meet you. And for those of you that we've reeled back in from our previous events, thank you so much for joining us. So for those of you who don't know, uh, we're Jalapeno Employee Engagement a team of strategists, researchers, coaches, and consultants who are on a mission to make work better. Based in Vancouver, British Columbia, we work closely with companies both at home and around the world to bring our vision of a better workplace to life. We believe that engaging in this type of work shouldn't be boring, and so we're here to spice up companies' performance and engagement, resulting in higher productivity and profitability. We love big ideas, data, and science-backed processes and craft tailored, visually appealing, and easy to understand reports to make information accessible. Following that, we don't leave you high and dry. Through individual and team mentorship, we ensure everyone has the skills they need to succeed and foster team accountability to ensure movement in the right direction. Our mission is really to help companies tap into the unrealized potential of what the workplace can be and to use data to drive happier, more engaged, and more involved workplaces. So let's talk a little bit about why you've chosen to spend your sunny Wednesday evening with us tonight. Um, tonight's event, it, we will be looking at leadership through the lens of parenting. And it's our hope that this event will help you understand the similarities between the psychological impact of le leadership and parenting, understand how leadership styles affect individuals in the workplace and their organizational commitment, as well as to gain insights on whether leaders are born or if they're made. And so our agenda for tonight, first we're going to be going over what research says about the leadership and parenting link. Then we'll get to our uh, highly anticipated panel discussion with our incredible special guests. And finally, we'll leave you with a little something as a thank you for attending. So before we get started, what's a jalapeno event without a couple of rules? I promise they're not too bad. Um, first of all, this is a safe space. And so what we want you to know is that it's okay if you don't want to show your face or your name on your Zoom picture um, or mention your company name if you don't feel comfortable. Nobody is here to judge you for your accent, your perspective, uh, or your opinion. And so if throughout tonight's event you don't get the chance to share your thoughts, you can send them in a chat message to the group or you can send them to me privately um, and we will address them uh, when we can. Secondly, everybody's here for a reason. At Jalapeno, we really like to emphasize that we want to listen to understand others and not to judge. And so our intention during our discussions this evening isn't to come to a consensus, but to share different perspectives and really revel in the learning that can come from that. And so secondly, nobody loves being cut off. So please don't uh, interrupt our speakers while they're talking. And instead, you can use the Zoom icons to raise your hand if you would like to speak. Uh, Hernan, would you like to give us a little demo? Yeah, sure. All right, there we go. We've got some claps. So if you do that, then we will know that you'd like to speak and we can make room for you to do so. And finally, please mute your audio to make sure that um, there's no distracting background noise that pulls away focus from um, the person who's speaking. All right, so I think you've all heard enough from me. Uh, I will now pass the torch over to Samin Sadat, um, our executive director. Samin will share a few research findings on this theme, as well as uh, addressing the gap that exists between science and practice in the workforce. So over to you, Samin. Thank you, Sarah. All right, thank you everyone for joining us today. So as Sarah said, I'm gonna talk about a few of the research out there that talks on this theme. So uh, during the first year of my university, as some of you might already know, I was very interested with the concept of parenting license. So this is the idea that people should become parents if only if they go through a series of basic training, not only for physical education, but for teaching how to foster healthy psychological development in children. I also understand there are many other factors involved and there will be many resistance and obstacles. 
However, now as I learn and advance more into organizational behavior and leadership while working with different leaders and employees, I realize how these two concepts are similar and how my early interest in parenting actually apply in leadership and organizational development. So I want to start with uh, walking you through an example on how these two concepts are similar. So I'm going to focus on developing a desired behavior in an infant. So one key aspect of promoting the desired behavior is establishing expectations and demands for behavior that is considered appropriate. Parents should clarify expectations and setting a standard for how children should behave. The second step is whether the child is willing to accept and adopt the parental expectation is really related to whether want and trust are the basis of the relationship with parents. The third step <clears throat> is parents need to provide explanations and reasons for the nature of behavior and misbehavior. In other words, parents provide irrational why the behavior is desirable or unacceptable. And they also have a discussion of the consequences or the feelings of people involved. And lastly, parents model such behavior themselves and making themselves the role model of their kids. So how can leaders develop desired behavior in their teams? So interest, in, in, interestingly, the leadership literature reports similar findings. Leaders promote a higher level of desired behavior and values by one, introducing clear expectations and demands that are appropriate, two, maintaining trustworthy and communicative relationships, three, directing attention to consequences, especially in terms of feelings, and lastly, by modeling the behavior themselves. So the next question we wanna talk about is where do our leaders come from? So most of the research on leadership has been on adult leadership. And there has been very little research on the origins of leadership capabilities and qualities in adolescence youth. Although most adults have described that their most important leadership training happened after they began their careers, research has shown that early life events are the most important developmental leadership experiences. So it's very surprising to find that, that adult leadership training and interve interventions contribute only a small positive impact to work outcomes, approximately nine to 10%. So what are, what are the roles of parents in building our future leaders? So individuals who come from authoritative parenting, so there are the parents with high level of expectations, but also high level of responsiveness, which is about providing the support and the wants the kid needs. And parents treat children in a valued manner. So therefore, children develop a very positive view of themselves, of others, and other relationships, which is one of the critical qualities of transformational leaders. And what is transformational leader? Transformational leaders empower their followers to work on long-term goals rather than immediate interests. They support their followers to grow and reach self-actualization, which is beneficial for organization and society. So also the kid with authoritative parenting, which is again, to repeat, parents with high expectations and high resp responsiveness, they are more likely to develop secure attachment style. So what is secure attachment style? So for example, a kid with secure attachment style, they typically have parents who are very responsive to their needs. So then the kids are more likely to feel more secure with themselves, with their relationships. They are more empathetic, more mature and less aggressive. On the other side, insecure infants often have parents who are either insensitive to their needs or inconsistent in responding to their kids' needs. Therefore, kids are more likely to be less secure about themselves, about their relationships. They are more likely to be less cooperative, less supportive. They have difficulties sharing their feelings, thoughts, and they actually experience more frequent breakups. So you might wonder, what does this mean for leaders? So at any point in life, an individual may be vulnerable to negative experiences due to lack of security within their family, their friends, school or environment, school environment. But the same individual may also drive benefits from positive experiences or what researchers call corrective experiences with a supportive and sensitive relationship with significant others 
and their leaders. So I'm gonna give you an example to elaborate this point. For example, individuals with insecure attachment come to your workforce and they expect their leaders to be rejecting or un unavailable, especially in times of stress. However, in a stressful situation, transformational leader becomes very responsive, res sensitive and considerate of their team members. Therefore, the insecure individual who expected insensitivity and unavailability now they are getting caring and accepting responsiveness instead. So this corrective experience can present the insecure individuals with an alternative worldview that they can have secure attachment with, with their world. So this is the concept can also be true for the other case where the secure individuals come to your work environment, but the security gets disrupted due to having a leader with insensitivity and lack of individual considerations. So the next question you might wonder is, why should I even care about this? Why should I even try to build secure attachment style with my team members? So as most of you all know, high turnover and lack of engagement is very, very, very costly for companies and economies. And that's why companies invest millions of dollars on keeping and growing their employees. So usually what happens, individuals can have Three, these three commitments towards their organization. First, affective commitment refers to an individual's identification with, involvement in, and emotional attachment to an organization. The second commitment is normative commitment, it reflects a feeling of loyalty toward the organization based on perceived obligation to be loyal. And lastly, continuous commitment is a tendency to maintain one's membership of the organization based on recognition of costs associated with departures, which right now we actually see on a daily basis that people are like, oh, I'm not quitting my job because I don't know what's happening with job market. So it's gonna be very costly for me to quit. So I'm gonna stay in this company. So employees with secure attachment often have effective commitment to their organization. So they have more positive experience at work and they have more positive attitudes toward others, due to their strong interpersonal skills, and they encourage high engagement and cooperation within the team. By contrast, insecure employees who lack self-regulation and security can have problems committing themselves to an organization, and unlike individuals with secure attachment, they have negative attitudes towards their interaction with coworkers and their team dynamics. So, to all the leaders in this room, to our HR people who joined us tonight, who are on the mission to create an environment for their team to grow, I want you to reflect for a second on how your team is made of humans and not machines. And actually, they're the one helping you fulfill your vision. Also, humans are the product of their past and all their relationship. And as a leader, you have two choices. One is you have the power to ensure you provide a secure and safe work environment where they can give you their full engagement. The second choice is you also have the power to disrupt the security and the engagement they bring with themselves to your work environment. So it's up to you how you would like to use your power. The decision is yours. But my last tip where you want to start with is the first thing you have to understand your role as a leader and your responsibility for your team's well-being. And the second thing, have awareness of your behavior and its impact on your team and eventually on your organizational success. Thank you. And this is a summary of the research out there on this theme. I had muted myself. Thank you so much, Samin, for those insights. Um, now I'd like to take the opportunity to introduce two additional jalapeno team members, Gabriela Freitas and Hernan Ochoa. Gabriela and Hernan are amazing organizational coaches and consultants who have been working closely with leaders and their teams, uh, observing the impact of today's topic firsthand. So their experience witnessing the effects of different leadership styles on organizational success make them the perfect choices to moderate our panel discussion this evening. I'll now turn it over to Gabby and Hernan to introduce our panelists. Great, thank you so much, Sarah. And once again, thank you all for being here with us this evening. We're very excited. I know I can speak for Hernan as well. We're very excited to be here and to just get insights into everyone's perspectives when it comes to such an interesting topic. Um, 
So we're going to kick off our panel discussion. And in order to do that, I want to introduce our panelists. Um, first and foremost, I'd like to introduce you all to Amy Stanley. So Amy, I don't know where you are. I can't see you, but if you could please just wave, say hello. Uh, say Hi. Hello. There you are. <laughs> Thank you, Amy. Um, so Amy is an adjunct professor at the Sauter School of Business at UBC, and she's also the head of the HR program at BCIT. Amy also runs her own leadership development business, um, and it's called Leading Light Executive Coaching, where she supports leaders to navigate their professional relationships, manage teams, and also handle conflict. Amy has 20 years of experience in the HR field while also having a global client list ranging from areas uh, from business, finance, education, and the government as well. She teaches leadership, organizational behavior, and performance management at both the undergraduate and graduate levels. Amy creates tailored workshops while also running courses through UBC's Executive Education Division uh, based here in Vancouver. Um, Amy brings humility, humor, and realism to her work with students and leaders alike. She believes that being prepared for the good and the bad things in the workplace really gives you the best chance for success. She is originally from London, UK, and she's lived in Vancouver since 2008. Um, and really proud moment, she became a proud citizen of Canada in May of last year. So congratulations, Amy. Just wanted to throw that out there. Yeah, congrats, Amy. That's amazing. Um, thanks, Gabby. So just to introduce our next panelist, uh, Nick Guala. So I don't know, can you say hi to everyone there, Nick? Hey, Nick. There we go. Um, so Nick Guala is a gold medal athlete, an MBA grad, and an executive coach. He is one of Canada's leading coaches for high achievers. He speaks professionally to thousands of people worldwide on resilience, leadership, and peak performance. He is also a published author and entrepreneur. Most recently, he was inducted into Wrestling Canada's Hall of Fame. These would be extraordinary achievements for anyone, but next case, he had the added challenge of growing up in foster care. Not only has Nick never let challenges stand in his way, he has actually found a way to turn them around and to fuel his success. First in his athletic career, and now in his professional career as a speaker, trainer, and executive coach. As a strategic advisor, Nick has been instrumental in leaders scaling their businesses and strengthening their teams. He has produced world champions in the mixed martial arts, as well as Olympians and Commonwealth Games gold medalists, in addition to being a Commonwealth Games gold medalist himself. And he holds a Bachelor of Science from Brock University, an MBA from Royal Rose University, along with a graduate certificate in executive coaching. With a proven track record of helping high achievers and businesses succeed, Nick is on a mission to build resilient leaders and businesses worldwide. So thank you so much, Nick, for joining us today. You're welcome. Yeah, welcome, Nick. Um, so up next, we have Bahi Vahidi, and she's an early childhood educator and parenting consultant with over 20 years of experience in working with children of different ages. So Bahi, I know you're in there somewhere. If you could just say hello to, to all of us. Just give us a everyone. Yeah. Welcome. Thank you. Um, so Bahi's passion is working with families to instill confidence, connectedness, as well as love in children by providing a nurturing environment. She's a graduate of the Early Childhood Education Program from George Brown College and is also a speech pathologist. She has an in-depth academic knowledge of developmental psychology and is also a member of the College of Early Childhood Education of Ontario. Bahi supports and educates parents at her consulting practice called Joyful Parenting. And you guys, if, if you're interested in this, you can learn more about her practice at www.joyfulparenting.life. Welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you. And last but not least, Troy Mitchell, who, fun fact, he has been part of our panel discussions before. So thank you so much, Troy. We're so appreciative of you coming back to, to help us out with your knowledge. So Troy has built an arsenal of tools and techniques from his many years of studying psychology and personal and professional development. He now uses, uses these tools and techniques to train professional athletes, top business professionals, cancer patients, gifted children, at-risk youth, counselors, nurses, and many groups, corporations, and organizations around the world. Troy has been featured in numerous publications, including BC Business Magazine, Event Magazine, The Morning Star, amongst many other. Getting back is very important to Troy. 
and is why he's involved with a number of fundraising efforts and has directly contributed to raising over $100,000 for charity in the last few years. Through Troy's thought-provoking and engaging workshops, participants grow and learn how to manage stress, increase focus, set goals and steps to achieve, be a leader, build a team, and overcome any personal or professional obstacle. In Troy's words, tools are important but are worthless without the skills to use them. People learn by doing, and my courses offer the perfect safe environment required to build their skills. Uh, I'm sorry, Troy, I didn't give you the chance to say hi to everyone, so you can just say hi. <laughs> Hello, everybody. How's it going? Thanks for having me here. Yeah, no, thank you so much for joining us, Troy. It's a pleasure to have you a second time. Great. Thank you, Hernan, and thank you to all of our pa panelists for being with us here today. Uh, we're very, very excited, like I said, to hear perspectives on such an interesting topic. So I just want to give a round of applause, a round of welcome to our panelists. Uh, you can either there you go. <laughs> this is the clap, clap on the Zoom box. Um, so just so we're all on the same page, uh, for the next little while, we're going to be addressing some questions with our panelists. Um, however, if the members of the audience have any questions that you really want to um, address, please feel free to write them in the Zoom chat box. And if we have time towards the end, we will definitely try, try our best to, to address those. And I think Samin just sent a chat to everyone, so we all know where the chat box is. So let's just kick off this panel discussion. Um, so leadership and parenting, right? We all probably have our own definition of what a good leader looks like or what a good parent does. Um, and I, to start off, I wanna get a sense of where we're at with our definitions. Um, Bahi, I wanna start with you. And what I wanna ask is, what does a good parent mean to you? So what does a good parent look like? Uh, what qualities do you see in someone that really lets you know that that person is ready to be a parent? Okay, uh, actually this is the common way to ask this question be good and bad uh, as qualities, but especially when it comes to parenting, I think it's not the healthiest way to think about that because when we put parent or people in just good and bad categories, it doesn't help us to make, to create a, a right conversation. So instead, I think that it's better to ask what is parenting or what is successful parenting? So to answer this question, uh, what I would really like to tell people is that parenting is a lifestyle. And a lot of this is about two um, um, aspects. The one, uh, one is about um, ongoing learning. We parents uh, actually uh, raise ourselves alongside our children to be able to nurture them, to be able to raise them. And obviously the skill that is enough for raising a baby or a toddler is not the same skill that we need when we are raising teenagers. So it is a, a lots of learning that happens for parents themselves. And also a interesting quality that I see in successful parents is that they see their child as a, as a whole person from the beginning. And according to how much the child understands, they have conversation, they hold them responsible, accountable, and also they respect them to the same level. And this um, creates a meaningful bond between the child and parent. So um, successful parenting uh, is all about um, ongoing learning. Also is about uh, building and maintaining a, a meaningful and respectful um, interaction and relationship between parents and the children. That's great. Thank you. Yeah, so lots of ongoing learning and really seeing your child as a whole person, as an equal, and, and having that open communication and respect. Thank you, Bahi. Um, and yeah, really good point, right? Not categorizing as good or bad, but successful. So using that, that language. Thank you. Uh, so Nick, I want to hear your take on this, but sort of leaning more towards leadership. So what does a successful leader mean to you? What do they look like? What qualities do you look for in a person that shows you that they're ready to be a leader? Yeah, it's, it's, that's an excellent uh, question. You know, the best leaders that I've seen, the ones that have made the most impact on me, 
And then when I think back, I think back to coaches, I think back to people in, in work situations. And the biggest thing that came up, they were good listeners, right? They had this ability to just listen. And I found when they listened, I felt that sense of importance. Second one, they were never the condemning type. They didn't go out to destroy people. You know, you would see people make a mistake, but they didn't really crash. Every mistake was a, a learnable situation. It was a learnable moment, an opportunity. So that was, that was another thing. The, uh, the other thing that I felt was really important that I, that I found out from uh, mentors and examples and people who are leaders in my life were they took an honest, sincere interest in people. They had this ability to just, uh, you feel like they cared about you. They connected. They, they were like, you knew them. You felt bonded to them. And you don't know why. Sometimes you didn't even know them long just by the way that they, that they uh, interacted with you. And the, and the last thing that I remember about that, those situations were you always felt important around them. Even if you weren't at your best, you felt important. So they didn't complain. They took an honest, kind of sincere interest in you. Um, they took, used every moment. They used a lot of the moments of learnable situations, right? And uh, yeah, and that's that's kind of um, those couple points, especially taking interest one and not really coming down on you when you were not at your best, but instead lifting you up. So that that's that's the big one. And listening, they listen well. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Nick. No, yeah, those are, those are really, really good points. And I think it really shows that link between what you said and what he said about parenting, right? You want to be good listeners. You want to see your children as equals, as well as you want to see your team members as equal, equals. You want to care for them and support them. Um, and that's really, really key. So thank you. Thank you, guys. You're welcome. Yeah, and just to add to that link, one thing that really resonated with both what you said, Bahi and Nick, um, I mean, from the parenting side, Bahi, you're saying like a parent is also learning as the child is developing. Um, and same with Nick, what you're saying is that the good leaders are good listeners. And when you're a good listener, obviously you're learning and you're developing with your team members. So you can see a lot of that parallel between both of them. And I actually just, before I move on to the next question, Nick, I wanted to ask a bit of a follow-up question to one of your points, which is around the sincerity. And I just wanted to ask if, as a leader, what's the first step that I could take to be a little bit more conscious about building that sincere relationship yeah you know that's it's a question a lot of people come up with or how do you take an honest sincere interest in somebody yeah. well listen everybody wants to feel understood everybody wants to feel seen everybody wants to feel heard so ask them about themselves you know everybody has a family everybody has a hobby everybody mm -hmm. has a place that they're from everybody has something that they're interested in the first thing in any uh, human relation thing is first we build a connection before we gain cooperation, before we get the leader. So the same thing, just like in dating, you just don't go from, hey, to being married. There's, there's a, a kind of a process you follow. So taking on honest to see your interest in, in somebody is like, hey, find out what they're interested in, their education, uh, and uh, where they're from, the things that make them tick, the hobbies that they do, you know, not just they're here to do something for me, but what about them? We're the most important person to ourselves. And when people inquire uh, about us personally, we always, we, there's a sense of connection that happens. Oh, we're important, we're valued. I must mm -hmm. be important. Okay. Yeah, that, I love that point. And I think a lot of it also also kind of around that sense of curiosity of just being genuinely curious about the people you're with. A hundred percent, that's a great word to, to sum it up. Well, thank you, Nick. So moving on to the next question, uh, one of the things that is surprising that Samin touched on the presentation is that adult leadership training and interventions really do have a small positive impact approximately, um, as she mentioned earlier, from nine to 10% of variance in work outcomes. Therefore, it's increasingly important to explore the role that parental practice plays in the development of leaders uh, throughout adolescent youth. So one thing, uh, and Becky, I wanna start with you is, do you think from from a perspective of parenting do you think that leaders are born or are they made and what do you think is the role of parenting in developing that leadership quality mm -hmm. uh, truly as a person who uh, has worked with uh, lots of children from early ages i believe that it is the combination of the both 
and because the, there's a tendency or personality trait in some children that they are interested to uh, to lead the children, they, they, to lead their friend. Uh, uh, and uh, that tendency um, can um, make it easy easier for them to fit in leadership uh, role. But we all know that true leadership is not possible without uh, necessary skills. Right, right. Uh, on the other hand, we see some children without that tendency that they are able to be very successful leaders when they when they get inter interested and when they learn the, the skills. So there is not such a thing uh, like uh, leaders are born with leadership skills. And so back to parenting, I, um, I see that wise parent, uh, for sure, for sure they help their children to learn and the skills that they are interested to. But at the same time, successful parents won't frame or won't uh, block their children in any title or any specific right. identity mm -hmm. from the beginning because, because they know that the world is changing very fast and also the value system is changing through the time. So it's the best to raise uh, people who are who have the uh, right skills to navigate the world and uh, the people who know themselves, their interests and their values. And it is the only way that we can have uh, successful people and at the same time, happy people. Because they, they, this, this is the combination that, uh, that is the best. Yeah. Thank you. No, and um, you said something I love and I think my my coworkers at Jalapeno can agree that every time someone brings up values, I get very excited. Uh, I think that's definitely one of the most essential parts. It's really like the foundation for any of these skills to develop is first, let's ground ourselves and see, okay, what are my values? And let's develop those skills around those values. Mm -hmm. And here, um, I'm yeah. sorry, one thing that I really like to uh, mention is that we live in a culture that leadership that values leadership and um, we, uh, we um, label non-leaders as follower and we disvalue their, disvalue their position. And it's good to recognize that uh, effective team players uh, as uh, um, valued people and uh, because they have, the, they have very important skills too. Right. So, this is the this is the culture that I I think it uh, we need to uh, revise it or we need to think in a different way about it. No, totally, I do agree, and I think um, when we talk about leadership, we do have to talk a little bit more about the mentality around it rather than a tie a physical title. Uh, yeah. I mean, yeah, even though you're not have a title of leadership, we're all leaders in a way, and we all express our skills in that in that light. Um, so what I want to do, Amy, is I wanted to get a little bit of your perspective um, also around this question, especially about where, where do you think we should invest the most to ensure that we are developing our future leaders? Mm, okay, so where do you think we should invest the most in terms of training? Is that what you mean? Um, yeah, in terms of training, develop them, especially from early on in their careers or even, even later on, where do you think is that point, um, whether it's skills, whether it's a mindset, uh, where do you think all that effort is better spent? Yeah, so I think that's a great question. So I think going back to what you were just saying there about who is a leader, um, I teach leadership at the master's level. And so I work with young people who, most of them have never held a leadership role, really. They might have held some kind of, uh, you know, role in the university but generally they haven't been in a leadership role yet and but they want to get to that point and I think what I start off is by trying to express to them that we are all leaders as you just said so to start leadership training really early I think is really important mm -hmm. so at that level you know we're talking to people who are kind of uh, in their early 20s and I've been teaching throughout the pandemic and uh, certainly we all went through huge changes in our work and our personal lives and they went through huge changes as students during that time and you know what I 
used to kind of base a lot of my discussions on was that how are you leading yourself through this process? So we are all leading ourselves every day through things that sometimes things that we, we are not enjoying. Uh, we're also kind of leading other people through those in certain, uh, certain ways as well. Uh, so I think it's really important to get, to get our young people to really believe them in themselves as leaders from an early age. So, I mean, those kind of people I'm talking about early 20s, but I would say, you know, going back to, to childhood, right? I mean, my children are fortunate to go to a school that really values leadership. And me coming from an old fashioned British background, I was kind of shocked when I went to what I would call the parents evening, uh, when I would expect the teacher to deliver me feedback on how my children were doing. And I was actually uh, very surprised to find that the teacher took a very, um, a very hands off approach and that the children were delivering their own feedback and they were analyzing their own progress and they were delivering that to me. So it was kind of confusing to me at first, but what I realized was that the school was trying to encourage children to step into that leadership role from a very early age. And it really gives them a lot of confidence. So I would say like there's never been too early a time to start that. In terms of people in the workplace, I feel like everybody needs leadership training. So for when, and as you said, like sometimes you may end up in a formal leadership position, sometimes not, but in terms of self leadership. So thinking about how can I get into that mindset that I'm responsible for myself and how I'm going to interact with other people is going to have an impact on them. So really making sure that people have individual accountability um, and focusing on using coaching, I think to do that, really getting them to tap into what they're actually really good at. So yeah, I would say there isn't a, an ideal time to start, but it's again, one of those things that you should learn throughout your life, I think. Totally. Yeah, and I really love this, um, this idea, especially when you're talking about younger um, kids or teenagers or like this idea of empowerment and telling like, okay, I'm gonna give you the tools, the space, for you yourself to come up with with that reflective feedback with saying okay how like getting my environment like how am i doing how am i interacting with things around me so i do love this idea of kind of getting in the reins a little bit mm -hmm. um i'm saying okay you you really have to take accountability to to measure your own performance right and i think if you do it as a child or as a young person you can mess up and it's okay yeah Right. Yeah. If you do it in, in a formal leadership role where you're being paid to do it and you mess up, the consequences can be, you know, quite bad in some cases. And that's kind of where we see people in the workplace trying to cover up uh, things that they haven't done very well. We end up dealing with conflict a lot of time because other people will get blamed. People don't want right. to admit those. So I think it's really important to start young while you've got that playground where you can you know, make mistakes and learn and define your leadership style so that when you do get to that point, you're going to be more successful. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Amy. Great insights. Yeah. Thanks, Amy. Um, so just moving on to the next uh, topic. Um, in parenting, we, we understand that our kids do what you do as a parent, right? Not necessarily what we might ask them to do. And if you think about companies and organizations, we also see this in a different way through our leadership, right? We hear so much that we should always lead by example, right? Our team members will follow our behaviors. So let's be role models. Um, but if we think about ourselves as leaders, when we're coming into our interactions with our team and we're coming into this company and our, our daily work, uh, work processes, we come into with a different position. We're in a higher position. We have higher power, higher authority. Um, Troy, this question is, is um, Geared towards you, I just want to see your perspective on this. Um, what I want to know is how can we still be role models for our teams while also taking these differences in power, authority, um, and positions into consideration? That's a really good question. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, again, it comes down to, you know, are you really being, you know, a leader from example? Um, but there's so many different ways to help empower your people to go above and beyond. Um, that's something I really, I don't know, that resonates with me a little bit. I just want to talk a bit about that because yeah. I've, I've seen an experience where there was a company that I worked with that had, you know, a, a normal career development plan. They would go through the process of sitting down with their leader and go through it and see exactly where they are um, underdeveloped, needing more skills or more knowledge. And of course, where they're meeting the acceptable range 
but the one company I worked with, they actually had, um, they had a four step. They had a level four, three, two, and one. And two meant you're just, you're doing the job acceptably. And one meant that you created something new for the company. Right. And everybody wanted that, that one level. And uh, because a lot of people that created that one level meant that they were really seeing outside of the box and they had some extra leadership qualities um, that the company, of course, was looking for. So, because it's very rare to be able to create a, a process or a system uh, that and make it better than what exists already in, in the first place. So, so that was something that I saw that was really cool about helping create and develop a leader within an organization. It was just a cool little systematic process that they would have for people. So, but as far as a leadership uh, position goes and a title goes, um, I like what Hernan was saying earlier, like forget about the titles. I mean, if you can be a person and talk to your people and, and see them as a peer, get to know them, understand what their values are, and then help them align their values with the company values. It's incredibly important to be able to understand that process. And a leader should really be able to see the evolution um, of their um, employees and see where their gifts and strengths are and where their other knowledge that they're bringing from outside of the company lies and be able to take those things and, and pull them and bring them forward. And so when it comes to titles, yeah, I'm not a, I'm not really a big fan of titles. I think one of the first things I do when I get into an organization is, is uh, when I work with them, I ask them for the highest title they can possibly give me because I don't like to deal with all the bureaucracy of the levels of, I don't want to go to one of the different divisions and then have a general manager saying, you know, oh, you're just a trainer or you're just a consultant. You know, we're not going to show you our books. And I'm like, no, wait a minute. I, I need you to show me your books. That's the only way I can do my job is to do full needs analysis or gap analysis. You guys might experience the same thing within your, <clears throat> with what you guys do. You might hit a few ceilings there a few times and you, you need to get the information. You need to get the data. You can't get it because you don't have the right title. Um, so titles are silly in a way that, you know, I always give me the best title you can. Bring me in as a director or as a VP or something so that I don't have to answer to anybody about getting or gathering data information to help you guys fill the gaps or fill the voids. And so, yeah, so when it comes to titles, I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm not a huge fan of them. I, I just look at people as people, right? Do you have the skills? Do you have the knowledge? Do you have the understanding? Um, and so when it comes to leadership, I mean, everybody is a leader. Everybody, your thoughts, feelings, and actions affect the lives of people around you. So what is your circle of influence? How well are you uh, doing at the position of empowering people and inspiring people and, and you know, listening, getting to know them, understanding what their gifts and their strengths are? Um, are they aligned with their true you know, wanting their aptitude. So yeah, titles, they, they're, it's a, you know, yeah, it's a political thing, right? Thanks, Troy. Um, just a couple of things that you said. Yes. Let's treat people as people, right? Titles really mean nothing at the end. We're all leaders. We all want to have that mindset, and encourage that mindset. Um, you mentioned, you know, as leaders, let's help align individual team members with the company values. Let's align their values with our values. I know Hernan gets super excited when we talk about values. Um, and I know they're so important to any organizational, any organization for our success. Um, as a leader, how, how do you think we can go about this? So how can we really align each team member to the company values and making sure that we're providing that space for them to thrive? Uh, it's about ongoing discussions uh, for one, but it's also about, um, I love doing personal development work. Um, personal and professional development work really goes hand in hand. And a lot of the companies I've seen do very successful work with uh, developing people on a personal level. Uh, they actually include that in their career development plans. They actually put in some personal development in there. Um, so when you do a personality survey or things like that, and you help people understand what their own personal values are, I mean, they really need to know what their values are. Definitely. Because yeah. a lot of people just tell a leader or a, a manager or somebody higher up, whatever it is that they want to hear. Right. But when you collectively go through a, a process, whether it's Myers-Briggs or, you know, whatever type of personality survey or, uh, when you try to figure out what people's characteristics are, what their values are, what their skills are. Um, so they need to know that for themselves first and foremost. And then you can, um, yeah, you obviously your company has already probably developed a list of values that they make very aware and let everybody know and talk about it at all the times, every single team meeting, every single manager's meeting, um, every opportunity you can, you always reflect on the company's values because you always want to make sure that they're, they're in the forefront and they're on people's minds and then empower them to make decisions uh, based on the values of the company, right? Any decision you want to make as an employee, you want to make, create a change or when you're dealing with a customer, if you're dealing with anybody, if you can 
you know, always look back at the values of the company and say, I made this choice because, and it aligns with the company's values. It's really hard for a manager or a leader to look at you and go, oh, what you did was wrong. Right. Because if you're aligning your decisions with the company's values, because you know them so well, then it's, it's quite easy to be able to get your point across and create change and, uh, and add value. Great. Thank you, Troy. I really like that. Just having those open discussions and those ongoing, that ongoing work uh, with values, with skills and aligning everyone to that. Thank you. Yeah. And kind of going back to that, um, that point, like I think another way um, to drive those values, of course, going back to Gabby's point is this whole leading by example, right? Leaders like set those values and really bring them in every meeting and constantly communicate them. The first, the second step as well is making sure that they're, they're living in themselves or else all these communication really goes to waste if, if I'm saying, okay, we want, we want collaboration and then we act in a completely different way. That kind of sense really different directions in terms of messaging. Um, so th the next thing I wanted to ask was, or rather just to contextualize this is the pattern that we see in parenting is that they try to create extraordinary moments to build relationships. Uh, this isn't true for every parent. This is, true for a lot of situations. For example, parents saying, we're gonna to go to Disneyland or we're gonna have this big birthday party to start building that relationship. However, what we actually see is that the most, the more meaningful, the most meaningful relationships are achieved when you actually have the space where you can speak openly and talk to each other about things that are important. Uh, some parents might actually feel guilty for not having enough money or time to, to provide these extraordinary relationships. Um, but we also see a parallel in organizations, and I think we've seen this, uh, I mean, for all of us in practice, we've seen this talking to leaders and asking them, okay, what do you do for your employees engagement, or how do you build these relationships? Sometimes a lot of the answers that we get is, well, we have, we go to bowling on Thursdays, or we have, uh, we go to lunch on Fridays, and which is great, not to, uh, not to dismiss that. But it's very external. And one thing I wanted to ask uh, you, Nick, is continuing on with this analogy of, of businesses and the organizations, how can we build these meaningful relationships without having to spend these resources of uh, time, money? Yeah, <clears throat> I get you. You know, the biggest thing I've, I've found um, is the word appreciation, right? Mm -hmm. to have appreciation. So here, here's what I'm going to, I'm going to share something. It's really cool. And I found it through uh, my daughter. My daughter had a ballet. She had her ballet recital. And after the ballet recital, she did a great job. I remember we got back to the house. We went to her mom's house and her grandmother was there and everybody was there. And, and so I pulled her aside and everybody was there. And I said, Hey baby, you did such a phenomenal job there. You looked so beautiful. You were amazing. Your smile was amazing. Everybody loved you. People were cheering for you. And while I was saying this, she was looking up at me like this with a, with a big smile. She just had this big smile, right? And, and out of nowhere, out of nowhere, her brother goes, Dad, what about me? What about me? I kind of see what I'm saying. <laughs> yeah appreciation was so strong she felt so good and everybody else acknowledged her I couldn't I could not take that smile away from her from her face so in organizations I bring that back to organizations it's important to find moments to appreciate the people around us sometimes people will stay in the organization just more for appreciation more than any raise that you will give them more than any other incentive that will be established so yeah. instead of adding a whole bunch of other things to that, find moments to appreciate the people in your organization. Find moments to catch them doing something right. Acknowledge it. Let everybody else know about it. And, and you'll make a difference in their level of engagement, but in their level of connection with the organization. I love that. And yeah, it's just an acknowledgement. And, and the reality, it's it's... It's such a, it's one of those things where it costs you absolutely nothing, yeah. but uh, still leaders have this, or not every leader, but a lot of leaders and business owners had this idea that I have to provide my team with all of these different uh, perks and 
I need to put ping pong tables around the building, stuff like that to like build these relationships. But whereas we're only like even a hello to everyone uh, builds that relationship. As you were talking at the beginning, Nick, as well as like being just genuine with your with your people. And um, I even heard it for one of my clients the other day saying, you know what, um, I'm I'm just having a really bad time at work right now because I've I've never appreciated it. And the other day it marked my one year at this company. And I didn't expect anything in terms of a raise or anything like that, but no one even acknowledged that I've been here for a, for a year. And that little fact of not being acknowledged made the whole situation so much more, um, it just brought him down. Just didn't want to work at that company anymore. He just didn't feel heard or seen in that company. Yeah. And that what you said is powerful because I just want to take it back to what Troy was saying. Troy was talking about values and aligning decisions with values. Well, those values are modeled by the leaders, right? So when the leader begins to model whether it's a value of appreciation, whether it's a value of just even asking question or taking a sincere interest in somebody or, you know, calling attention to, to mistakes indirectly to some yeah. degree. Well, the employees are gonna model those exact same things. So I was completely with Troy as he was speaking about that, hey, you know what, I made this decision because of this so-and-so value that the organization already exhibits. So that, that was well, that, that connects everything. Oh, thank you, Nick. Um, and with the same question, I wanted to open it for any other panelists that just wants to jump in that may have a, a different take on it or wanted to add on. Um, and again, we want to ask like, how can we build these meaningful relationships without having to spend any resources or any, or any really meaningful time? Yeah, if I can just jump in there, and I think particularly right now, this is an important time to ask that question because our employees need to be recognized more than ever right now for the efforts that they're putting in in difficult situations, plus our organization's budget for you know, being able to recognize people by spending money has probably gone out the window in the last few months. So I think it's really important that we spend more time doing that. And I think as people have said, you know, it really comes from the top in terms of setting the right tone for passing on that appreciation. Um, but I think particularly just, just for managers in general at any level, just to be aware of, you know, how much difference it makes in order to have those kind of open discussions and talk about things that went right, but also things that didn't go right. And it kind of goes back to that thing of creating a, a psychological safety in the workplace so that people feel able to share things that worked and perhaps things that didn't work so well. And then creating that really strong bond as a team. So people can make mistakes uh, and that's gonna be okay. Um, but we can all kind of learn from those and, and particularly in this current environment where we're all kind of learning, adapting, messing some things up, getting some things right, you know, maybe building a different kind of vision of what our organizations look for or look like rather. Um, so I think it's really important that everybody kind of works together in that respect as much as possible. And like you said, it doesn't really cost anything. But it's, that's the stuff that people need to feel valued. And that's the stuff that people need to stay in those organizations. And it's funny because when I work with undergrad students, I always ask them, how much money do you think you need to be happy at work? And they always come up with these amazing numbers, you know, like, oh, I need 150,000 a year. I'm thinking, <laughs> what? you know, wish they paid me that to teach you. Um, but, you know, they, they really think that money is going to bring them happiness at work, right? And then when you get to work, you realize quite quickly, of course, you need a certain amount of money. But actually, there are many, many other things that you need in order to feel fulfilled. And very few of them come from those extrinsic uh, rewards that you kind of think you should go chasing after all your life. So, yeah, something that, people, that you learn kind of the hard way, I think. Totally. Um, yeah, thanks Amy, for that insight. That's, that's great. Um, and one, one, so the next question I wanted to do, I wanted to change our focus a little bit about when, when we're going through tough times. Uh, so for example, if co-parents or co-founders are not getting along, uh, if the economy is tough or if the finances at home are tight, what would be, and Bahi, I wanted to ask this for you is what would be your best tip for parenting during challenging, challenging times? Hmm? Okay, should we 
I believe that the challenging time is, is an opportunity of teaching and learning again. And the, let's talk about the, the drastic change and challenge that we all are facing these days. And everything is changed and uh, parents for sure is not the easy experience for them to, because they need to manage their own issues. Also the, the children are at home with tons of questions that parents need to answer properly without making them more anxious or mm, worried. So mm -hmm. it, I think that parents in challenging time need to know, need to understand the, the world of children, to know how to answer their question and how to manage their own anxiety. Uh, so um, the world of children is not as big as adults and they, uh, the, the main source of information for them is their parents. And the, the, the biggest thing that they want to know is that, am I going to be okay? Or is my mom and dad will be okay? So um, also uh, children are very adaptable and very resilient when we face the, the challenging time. So, um, um, also depending on their age, they have some question. And if parents open the, the atmosphere of openness, that every question is allowed is, the, is, the, is very helpful. And uh, children are really very uh, clear in their question and they easily let us know what is in their mind. So if they, they ask, for example, if they ask a simple question, but it don't go further and explain more than they, uh, they ask or if we, they ask a question that we really don't know, um, I, we can honestly tell them that we don't know. And I think that they, they can learn that. Even if we don't know things, it doesn't mean that we are not safe. Right. Uh, easily we can let them know that we're going through this situation um, day by day. We are together, we have each other, we take care of each other. These are all good messages that uh, it's helpful for our children. And uh, just if they feel that we are anxious, they might hold their question back. And suppressed question won't disappear. Mm -hmm. And also, um, why it is important that we manage our, manage our anxiety? Because children are watching us carefully and they, they get nonverbal messages. Uh, to to decide how they should feel about the situation. So, if uh, parents, we parents, this is a good. It's a good uh, news that we as parents have lots of power and uh, lots of ability to minimize our children's anxiety by um, regulating ourselves and by managing our anxiety uh, in appropriate way, like to our. Um, community with family and friends and also the uh, resources that, that is available this day for all of us. So um, I believe that um, the biggest suggestion for parenting in challenging time is uh, regulating or managing our uh, anxiety. Also the atmosphere of openness is that is part of that healthy relationship, it's, it's really helpful. Yeah. Thank you. And it's really interesting because I'm seeing a lot of connections here um, with what has been spoken. Uh, one, and coming back to the point you're saying that if we if we want to develop our kids better, we want we need to put ourselves in an equal playing ground with them and saying we're all going through this together. And again, going back to this link and this parallel between leadership and parenting, because Bahida, I think the answer you gave was, um, I see a lot of similarity with what Amy was saying earlier about leading mm -hmm. in, the, especially in these tough times, which is about acknowledging what's happening and really recognizing uh, what either, either your kids or your employees, what they're doing and how they're helping. Um, and again, I think acknowledging these, these situations and talking and being open, also connecting it back to what Nick was saying about building these genuine relationships. Exactly. And I think all these points of discussion is you don't really have to spend money again. You don't have to spend time to build this relationship between those hard times. It's all about acknowledging it and really being together as one unit and just mm -hmm. just having those open conversations. 
Um, so before I think, because I think we have some some audience um, some audience questions that we might that we that we will address. Um, does any of the other panelists want it, want to share a last thought on this specific question? Uh, maybe in in terms of either parenting or leadership on how to lead during these tough times and through difficult situations. Sure, uh, if I can take a moment, it's this one's uh, this one's the key. This one's very important to me because this defines a whole organization. Because you don't know what you can do until problems hit, until we have some uh, some uh, what is it? Some storms in the sea, right? So mm -hmm. I think what it comes down to a lot of times, again, this is from from experience, is you truly get to see what you're made of when things are not going so well. Whether it's a whether you're co-parenting or whether you are uh, you have co-leaders in an organization. So the biggest thing I found out is <clears throat> how do you determine what that hard time means? During that hard time, do you define when things aren't going so well? Is it failure or is it feedback? What's okay. interpretation you have on that? Okay, what are you going to focus on? Are you going to focus on a learning? Or are you going to focus on blame? Because that's huge, right? A lot of us go to blame when things aren't going wrong. Oh, it's not my fault. Like, mm -hmm. I think it was Amy that was mentioning it when, you know, corporate in corporate, everyone likes to blame. Nobody wants to be accountable for it because sometimes big, the big mistakes cost a lot of money. So is it feedback or is it failure? What is What kind of core values would you have around that? So figure, figure that out for yourself or for your family. So when hard times uh, come you know what to put your put your feet down on is it going to be are you going to decide to learn from a situation or are you going to decide to blame during that hard time right so as as we have those in mind as we know what the core values is i think that's defines how we're going to react during those challenging times whether we're in a family or whether we're in a leadership i see it you know I, i'm not with with uh, my significant other either. So we have to learn how to be together with the kids. Just like in an organization, when things aren't going well, right? You have to, now we have to figure out what are the core values have, what beliefs do you have, and how will you move forward together, even if you don't agree on everything, but it has to be some core things that you, that you agree on, and that's what's gonna link you together, and that's what I, what's gonna help you move forward. I love that, and I, I love that idea. Let's first contextualize and define what a problem is, uh, or like, well, like I think I love it. It's like rephrasing. It's not a problem; it's a learning opportunity. Yeah. I think I like well the basic and and that, what the power of those definitions, as you said, uh, influence how you respond to it and the behaviors that come after uh, this specific scenario. So I do love this whole idea of let's first come together and say, okay, how do we define a problem? How do we how do we actually see it? What are our assumptions behind it? How do we what are the what are the regulations? Not the regulations, but what are the behaviors that we want to encompass when we face these situations? So yeah, thanks for that, Nick. Nick. I just want to add. Uh, I just want to say hi to to Nicholas and say yeah, that's awesome. And I think in the personal development world, they call it crisis or opportunity, right? Is it a crisis or mm -hmm. opportunity? So yeah, I think Nicholas will probably should probably use that term probably a few times. I imagine. And, in that development work. That's awesome. Um, so being so being mindful about the time, because I know we're already five minutes um, ahead of well behind of time. But we did wanna we did wanna address some of the questions from the audience. So I don't know if if uh, Sarah, you wanna read out some of these questions here. Sure. Um, one that uh, we have from Jim is that. Given the research, that research suggests a very low impact from adult leadership training, um, do any of our panelists see systemic flaws in how uh, this training is deployed in organizations? And if so, what shifts could be made or need to be made in either to improve the outcomes uh, in this area? I would Does that address say, to anyone? Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Amy. Sorry, I'll be quick. I would just say that I think that the problem with leadership training in organizations is that you can't take a one-size-fits-all approach. 
because everybody is different and everybody uh, are doing different roles. So I would say, you know, while it's okay to give a foundation and what is leadership and what does it mean and looking at different leadership styles, ultimately everyone needs to create their own leadership style. And you only really can do that by having individual training development, by having uh, one on one coaching so you can identify you know, what your flaws are and what you need to overcome to, to become the leader that you want to be. Um, so I would just say having a great mentor in place is a perfect way of learning, uh, having really good uh, team around you that will enable you to, again, make mistakes and pick yourself up and try again the next day. And just having one-on-one -on -one coaching or having one-on-one -on -one development, I think is much better than a generic leadership program. Hola. Can I add to that also? Yeah, was, please. You know, there's, there's a thing that I find is missing a lot of times uh, during, in, in creating leadership kind of courses or getting the people in an organization to go to it is they don't know what's in it for them. Sometimes people find it as remedial, you know, mm -hmm. something that they have to do because they're not good enough. It could be something as saying, hey, we've identified you and saying if it's organizational. We've identified you as one of the people who have potential to go big in an organization. You know, we want to, this is an opportunity for you to get more training. You know what I mean? Because I think it could really help you even add more to what you're doing because we've identified you. There's something in it for you, but identified you as what as one of the people we want to invest as leaders in the organization. So when there's something, when we, it's important for us leaders to take the extra couple of seconds to say, Hey, this is what's in it for you to do this. Cause it's, Essentially, we all act through our selfish self-interest. You know, I'm not afraid to admit that. Lots of people aren't afraid to admit that. So when we know that there's something in it for us, our motivation automatically goes up because now I'm doing it for me. I'm not necessarily doing it for you. I have something to gain from it. So as leaders, take a little time to see what it do. I know the person who this is for. Know the people who you're sending it for. Then let them know what they're going to gain as a result of, of going there and why you want them to go there so they don't think i'm doing it for sam if sam is going to gain from this what am i going to get from it right yeah no, that's yeah. a really really good point point. and that's where a career development plan comes into play like it's when it's already set you already have like a, a vision of where your career is going and in that development plan you have personal and professional development whatever it might be i mean i've seen so many people that work in a particular position and suddenly move because they've done so well in that position, move into a supervisory or management position, but they don't have the skills to work with people. But if you have that in a development plan, you can start those things much earlier. Like when I worked with Cal Tire, they had a, uh, they actually worked with Harvard. They brought in the Harvard online management training to anybody that was even on the career development path to be a manager. So it's, it's a nice way to really form that out when it's a, when it's a part of the plan. Well, and I think like uh, one thing that I that comes to my head is this idea of like being proactive about these things uh, with what with what Nixon and Troy said if like if we take this in a proactive step and say okay here's the benefit for you I also feel like these these development and these trainings stay a lot longer uh, I mean obviously one of the things that as consultants it's very rare for a company to come and say hey we're doing great come work with for us like come work with us we're doing amazingly so the problem is like when, when you come in there to, to remedy something or, or fix something, um, some, of these, some of these trainings or developments, they don't stick. They're just like, okay, we fixed, uh, we fixed the situation, now let's move on. And some of these skills really do, do start fading away. So I think we have uh, one, more, one more audience question, Sarah, or? Yes, um, we've got one last one uh, from Carl. And this is just directed to all of our panelists. So anybody who has a thought, feel free to chime in. Um, the question is, do you think that there is still a place for respect of elders uh, in your perspective about parenting and leadership? Oh my God, can I jump in there? There's a huge <laughs> gap between, I mean, it's just a part of the evolution, the way the economy has gone over the years. You know, I mean, if you go back, look at the 60s where, you know, women wanted to work because they wanted more money. And then the 70s kind of developed on that. But the 80s, you know, um, both men and women needed to work in the household so they can, you know, have that extra money. And then the 90s, you had to work because you just had to make ends meet. And now it's almost like we need multiple streams of income. But it's our children, whereas both parents are just being more pushed into the workforce, you know, who's, who's developing our children and how are they developing? And 
I think it's one of the greatest missing gaps in our culture right now is, is, you know, I know no offense to my parents, but I would have loved to have them to help develop my children more. But in our culture, it seems like our elders are surrounding themselves in, in uh, communities that are gated, hiding from the rest of the world and, and then, or spending six months, you know, in the South, you know, away from the whole family and stuff like that. So um, just my opinion, I've seen um, that there is a, a big gap. I, I wish our children and our elders were connecting more and I actually was a part of a, a wonderful opportunity to have my oldest daughter um, go and take schooling in um, Coldstream Meadows um, retirement home. Um, the teacher got it approved by the government to actually go bring the students and have a full year course working with elders um, where they lived in Coldstream Meadows. And it was one of the greatest experiences I've ever seen watching the elders coach and help teach and train uh, the children. It was beautiful. Thank you. Thank you, Troy. Uh, anyone else have anything to add to that point? Yeah. You know, one of the biggest uh, social cultural shifts that I've seen that I'm actually excited about, but some people don't like it, right, is corporate downsizing. What corporate downsizing demonstrated was what, and what it created was a lot of contract workers. Who are most of those contract workers? People who have been in other organizations for a significant amount of time, maybe people who were uh, retired or close to retiring. Now they were available if we're looking at the organizational side of it. So now what happened, a lot of, of those people who are contractors started, started getting hired by organizations and because they got hired, but one of the interesting stats that came out, a story, I can't give you those stats, I don't remember right off my head, is that they started adding so much more efficiencies or creating so much more efficiencies in organizations. Why? Because these people have spent the, uh, 40, 30 some odd years or more doing a specific kind of job that they can do that job now with their eyes closed. So they were able to help the upcoming generation, you know, instead of them making all the mistakes, they were able to bypass a lot of those mistakes to get to where they wanted to get to a lot faster. So definitely, I mean, the, the older generation is so, so needed. Yeah. I almost yeah, feel like you're talking about me there though, Nicholas. I'm, I'm starting <laughs> to, I don't feel like I'm that old yet, but I guess that's where I'm moving to. <laughs> But no, and I think that's a big concern or a big issue that has to be tackled for a lot of organizations is how do we still ensure this whole culture around knowledge sharing and transferring that knowledge that is so precious and that has maintained so many years to develop, how do we still keep that without pushing it away or putting a boundary around it? Um, so I do see a lot of value in that, in that point for sure. Uh, so if anyone has any last thoughts on this or else I think Gabby has a lot a final question before we before we let you guys go All right, great. So I'll just uh, jump on there. So of course being considerate of time um, I do have one final question for our panelists um, and this is open to each every single one of you guys um, Whoever wants to jump in go ahead um, Question sort of twofold or it's two different questions, um, but we see that leadership and parenting is so so linked. There's, there's such a, a big relationship and different kinds of behaviors from parents and different behaviors from leaders that we want um, to, to cultivate and to foster. Um, when it comes to leadership and or parenting, what is your best advice? So if we're looking to you know, become successful parents, if we're looking to become su successful leaders, what advice would you give us? And again, this is open to anyone, whoever wants to jump in. Yes, Bambi. Um, oh. Yeah. Oh. Uh, I think the my best parenting advice is just take it easy and just believe in their natural ability to learn and give them enough space and they will show you who they are, what they want. And this is the main ingredients of easy, happy parent. That's it. Beautifully said. <laughs> yeah. I'm gonna try that. <laughs> when after I finish, I go downstairs. <laughs> Wish me luck. Um, my best advice for both of those things is just be yourself. And you know, there's lots of stuff about authentic leadership, and I really passionately believe in that. And just just being yourself, bring yourself to work, bring yourself. You know, when you're working at home as a parent, you are gonna 
you know, have bad days and you're going to really mess things up and that's okay, you know, and it's okay to, to show that to your kids. And I think to people that work as well, that they will relate to you as a human being. And I think people are much more likely to follow you as well. Uh, and hopefully my kids follow me sometimes. Um, <laughs> if I'm just myself and I just try and show them the best part of myself, but also the times when I'm uh, not my best as well. That's my advice. Thank you, Amy. I know that's great. Just, just be yourself and everything will sort of work itself out in some way or another. <laughs> right, exactly. Well, let's hope so anyway. <laughs> uh, Troy or Nick, do you guys have any, any advice for us? Yeah, you know what? I'm going to jump on, on in Amy's bucket there and, and it's it. You can only, you can do you the best of anybody. Nobody can do you like you can do you. So be your best. And, and if I was to add to do your best, it would just be, um, Find somebody else who's done it before too. If you know, if you've identified, you know, the basic characteristics you want to acquire and the things you want to learn, find some, there's always somebody like who's done it before mm -hmm. in your organization, in your family, get some tips, you know, model to say, what, what is it like? Um, we just follow somebody. We follow examples of people who are actually done, not necessarily people who say, but people who've done uh, and they're all around us. You just got to identify it then do it. Yeah, that's great. Thanks, Nick. Uh, Troy, one last piece of advice for us. You know what? For me, it's just, it's, it's live your truth. There's, there's a big difference sometimes between what you think is right and what is truth. And uh, when it comes to your kids or your team members or in a business with customers, uh, live your truth. Always, always do your best to live your truth. And, uh, mm -hmm. and I just amplify what, what Nicholas and Amy said as well is about just you know, uh, bringing the best you to the table, right? Whatever you're going to do, do it fully, you know, put your heart into it and put your heart and soul into it. And, and uh, yeah, just strive to be your best. Great. Uh, thank you, Troy. And thanks to, to all of our panelists for, for that, those pieces of advice. Um, so because we are sort of running out of time, um, I do want to give this back to Sarah to conclude today's events. But before I do, once again, thank you so, so much, um, you guys as panelists for being here, for sharing your your insights, your perspectives, and thank you to the audience for bringing in those new questions as well and for being, for being here with us during the discussion. But Sarah, yeah, thank, you. thank you. Thank you. I couldn't say it better than Gabby just did. Uh, we're truly so grateful to have everybody here, panelists and audience members. So thank you so much for your participation today. Um, if there was a question uh, that you weren't able to answer, you can feel free to reach out to uh, jalapeno at info at jalapenoband.com and we'd be happy to um, chat with you more. Um, and so as with all jalapeno events, we want to leave everybody with a little something to say thank you for uh, spending your evening with us today. And so for this event, uh, we thought it would be fitting. Um, we'll be offering our leadership style assessment uh, completely free. Um, and so this assessment will help you learn more about your current leadership style, um, provide insights on how to harness your leadership style to drive engagement and performance uh, in your team. And so um, thank you again, and we mean it when we say we couldn't have done it without everybody that showed up tonight. Um, so keep an eye on your inbox for your thank you gift, uh, and we look forward to seeing everybody out at our next event. So thank you very much, and have a great evening. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Great working thank with you. you. Thank you, everybody. Great thank meeting, everybody. Bye, everyone. Thanks, thank, thanks, Troy. Thanks, Amy. Thanks, Bye. Thank you, guys. Bye, nice thank you, guys. Thank you. Nice to be here. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Thank nice to meet you. you guys, too. Thank you, guys. Bye. 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 Take care. Bye. Bye. We have our food here. And my mom. Mom, you can leave now. <laughs> <laughs> or you can stay.